Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, COVID-19, Rebuilding Municipalities Around the Globe. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have joined the webinar using your computer speaker system by default. Due to the high capacity of this webinar event, computer audio will be used in today's session rather than a phone dial-in option. You will have an opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing them into the questions pane in your control panel. You may send in your questions at any time and we will address them during the Q&A session. I would now like to introduce Lauren Millier, Executive Vice President at MVB Insight. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you very much, and thank you, everyone, for participating today. Um, I understand that we're going to have well in excess of uh, 600 people participating in this, um, so we, we very much uh, look forward to, uh, to achieving those numbers. Um, I'd like to just uh, reiterate uh, what has been said. Welcome to the seventh webinar um, in the International Economic Development Council series on how economic developers and their communities are addressing the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, for the foreseeable future, IDC will be hosting these free webinars on Monday afternoons with the intent to share resources, tools, best practices, and the latest updates. Today, we are honored to welcome a group of IEDC's international experts to share their tools and experience with us. Uh, and we've gone from um, around the globe in, in drawing these experts uh, into today's session. Um, our speakers include Mary Moran, the President and CEO of Calgary Economic Development, uh, Juan Pablo Alcantar, Director of Tuxpan Economic Development, Tuxpan Veracruz, Mexico, Dan Silverman, is the Vice President Foreign Direct Investment for Invest Quebec in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, and Greg Clark, who is a Global Advisor, Future Cities and New Industries Representative um, in London, UK. Um, we're very excited to have you join us all today. A recording of this webinar, as well as the presentation slides, will be available on the IEDC COVID-19 webinar page uh, within 24 hours. I'd like to remind everybody uh, that you can type your questions into the questions tab on your GoToWebinars dashboard, and representatives from IEDC will be standing by to answer them. When our presenters come to the end of their presentations, that is when all four have had an opportunity to speak, We'll ask them a few questions, and then we'll also take questions from the audience. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce Mary Moran. Uh, Mary became president and CEO of Calgary Economic Development in 2015. Mary brings extensive leadership experience in strategy, marketing, stakeholder relations, and fund development with leading companies, including Telus Delta Hotels, Canadian Airlines, and Ward Air. Mary is the CEO of Opportunity Calgary Investment Fund, a board director of the Calgary Film Center, and was CEO of Calgary 2026 Bid Corporation to host the Winter Olympic and Paralympic Games. Mary earned an MBA from Royal Roads University. She's active in the Calgary community and serves as the director of the Calgary Petroleum Club, O'Brien Institute for Public Health, and is the chair of Sport Calgary. I'd like to turn this over to Mary at this point. Thanks Mary, very much, Lauren. And uh, thank you all for participating. Um, I know for me personally, we were very much looking forward to hosting the IEDC Future Forum in September, but of course that's been postponed. So this is the next greatest thing to connect with our colleagues uh, around the world. Um, I'm gonna, um, and, and by the way, I look forward to welcoming you all to Calgary in the, in sometime in the future. Um, but I'm going to start. I'm going to start our conversation about Calgary with a little bit of history about pre-COVID, because our COVID story is quite unique, um, and it, we'd like we like to refer to uh, experiencing what, uh, a twin crisis on an already fragile base. And although that fragile base somehow, in some ways, has prepared us, uh, in, in other ways, it's made it really it, quite difficult. Um, and I don't, it sounds like there's echo. Can everybody hear me okay? I'll just assume so, unless I hear from somebody else. Great. I'm we can hear you fine, Mary. Great. It sounded like somebody was not on mute, so it sounded, I could hear a real uh, 
echo, so now I can't. So thank you very much. But anyway, back to Calgary. Um, it, it's definitely, you know, the pre-COVID uh, fragile base that I talked about has prepared us in some ways to survive COVID. Uh, and then in other ways, it's been absolutely merciless, leaving both businesses and, and people in a very fragile state. So I'm going to start by um, answering kind of the big questions that we need to answer about Calgary often when we're out doing our pitches, which is, uh, where the heck is Calgary? Oops, just a second here. Sorry. There we go. So Calgary is, um, it's, it's one in the second most westerly province of Canada, and we're at the base of the Rocky Mountains. So we're about an hour away uh, from Banff, Alberta, which most people have heard of heard about. And we're the fourth largest city in Canada. And our population is the one of the youngest, highest educated, and most diverse populations across the country. And although we used to make up about 10% of Canada's GDP, since uh, the uh, first structural change in the energy industry, we now make up about six and a half percent of the Canadian GDP, but we're, we're really kind of punching above our weight. Um, and the, our energy and the related services make up about 30 percent of our economy. We have the highest concentration of head offices, and this is not just in energy, but agriculture, transportation, and logistics. And uh, probably our, our greatest uh, attribute or our proudest moment is is that we have been consistently um, uh, awarded the most livable city in the Western Hemisphere by the Economic, economic uh, Intelligence Unit. We, and certainly this would sound like we have all the ingredients to be successful and to have a resilient economy. But there is no way to describe our journey other than to say that it, it has been a long uphill road with many twists and turns. And every time we think that we're turning the corner from an economic perspective, it feels like we, we are faced with a, another rapid uphill climb. And, uh, and certainly it feels almost like we have been playing a giant game of whack-a-mole. And this is starting as far back as, as the worst flood in, in Calgary's history that happened in 2013 that was the, at that time was the most costly natural disaster in Canada. And certainly we were shut down for a few weeks. Fortunately, there were only a handful of deaths, but 100,000 people were displaced from their homes. And then shortly after that, like many other jurisdictions around the world, we were subject to the structural change that happened in the energy industry with global oil prices plummeting from $100 into the 20s. And Calgary was hit hard and it was hit fast and mostly because it's a white collar uh, city. We don't actually have uh, carbon molecules underfoot. They are throughout the province, but the head offices were here. And un unemployment went up to almost 11%. And we now have about 25% uh, uh, vacancy in office space. So we have 14 million square feet of empty office space. And certainly when you look at other jurisdictions like Houston or Denver or Austin or Detroit, we have the highest concentration of office space on a per capita basis across North America by a long shot. We're double what Toronto has, we're triple what Houston, Denver, Austin are, we're three times the amount of Detroit. And we have enough office space to support a population of close to 4 million people. And so in some ways, we've been operating in this crisis for about six or seven years. And sadly, although we have the best environmental, social, and governance uh, standards in the world for our oil and gas production, regulatory process has prevented us from getting our products to the rest of Canada and also to uh, around the world, um, where we could be actually helping with the global climate challenges that face us today. And by the way, we're not just about oil and gas, we're also about wind and solar and biofuels, geothermals and other sources of renewables. And we really like to think of our provinces having all, all things energy that can actually help solve problems for, for around the world. We're also strong in agriculture and transportation and logistics and the, the home to one of Canada's uh, national airlines as well as railways. So with that introduction, um, sorry, I'm just trying to advance my fifth. Needless to say, uh, we have complex problems. And, you know, we have been spending the last several years 
developing a strategy that we worked in con in conjunction with Boston Consulting Groups and CEOs from across sectors and looked at the macro trends that are facing or coming towards our industrial sector like a tsunami. So IoT, AI, autonomous systems, robotics. And with 25 billion devices being connected by 2025, it's expected that there'll be a $14 trillion injection into GDP value globally. And most of that application to those technologies are, are in the industries that Calgary excels at. So we had to shift. And we've been focused on that for the last several years. So we are focused on talent, the adoption of innovation, continuing to invest in our place, including arts and culture, sports and recreation, transit, and also making sure that we were business friendly. And these are table stakes. So Calgary in the new economy is about our journey to be the city of choice for the world's best entrepreneurs to come here and embrace advanced technologies and solve problems for the world. And we were making headway. We saw triple the amount of enrollment in, in courses that support uh, advanced technologies. We've had uh, boutique tax credits that have stimulated uh, investment into the marketplace. Uh, we've had we've attracted tech companies. We have had a few companies do a billion dollar deal, including one that was bought by Morgan Stanley here in Calgary that focuses on fintech. And over the last 12 months prior to COVID, we had seen 27% growth in tech jobs. And certainly we've been helping the local ones grow here. But COVID, as I said, was a twin crisis for us because not only were we dealing with the health issues that were impacting our economy, but then there was this global oil price war induced by the Saudis and Russia. So we had this precarious health and economic crisis. And certainly, although it is, this has been hard, it has been particularly hard in Calgary as it relates to other cities across the country. And the reality is, is what we thought was a 15-year project with Calgary in the new economy for our recovery is now probably turned into a 20 or 25-year project. And like many of you who are left dealing with the chaos of, that has been induced by COA, COVID, including deaths, increasing diagnosis, layoffs, and companies trying to figure out what to do next, we really had to break it down to three phases. Uh, for us to manage the work we do, how we service the community. And so we, those three phases that we have are called respond, rebuild, and recovery. And the reason that we say recovery is, is because we actually know that we were just going back to recovery because we were on a long road to recovery when we came back. So when we get through respond, when we get through rebuilding some of the businesses and people that we're uh, working in our community, that we will be going back to recovery. Now, the governments, I will say, have been better aligned now than they have uh, certainly during the, the four, four or five years of the economic downturn that we have been facing. And like many of the jurisdictions that you service or serve, the, these programs have been iterative. But when we look at re respond, rebuild, and recovery, we're looking at how we can help people, how we can help business, and how we can help large, the, large, the economy at large. And when it comes to people, obviously the first and foremost important thing is, is that we take care of the health issues. But we've also had to take care of, uh, the, uh, we have had to take care of people's financial situation. And so the government has been very focused on people and businesses liquidity. So the first program that they introduced was uh, Canada Emergency Response Benefit, which was providing people with about $2,000 a month. Uh, this actually was, was replaced by the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, which is allowing companies to keep people employed and covering 75% of their wages. You can see that under business. There was a Canada Emergency Student Benefit that was introduced. And we, local, we as an organization, created a board, it's not just a job board, it's actually a marketplace and a job board called Connecting YYC. So even during COVID, we have tech companies that are still hiring and we have COVID opportunities that are being promoted on that job board. And then we have a marketplace, a marketplace where people can come and find out about COVID opportunities and, uh, and direct them to where they can apply for RFPs. 
Under business, I talked about the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, subsidy but the Government of Canada also introduced a, a Canada Emergency, and that should say business account, not bank account. I wish they <laughs> introduced a bank account, but a business account. And the business account is a $40,000 interest-free loan, of which 10000 is given uh, with forgiveness, and then... Um, and then the 30,000 has to be paid back by 2022. We have obviously received many uh, corporate uh, property income and education tax deferrals from all orders of government, the municipal, the provincial, as well as the, uh, the federal government. And the emergency commercial rent assistance was just implemented last week, which is both the provincial and the federal government, which is helping uh, companies uh, with their rent obligations and also helping the landlords who were being left as almost like serving like banks. We have started a, a program and we'll really focus on this during the rebuild, which is support local YYC. YYC is the three letter airport designator for Calgary uh, for the non-Canadian people in on the phone call. And uh, this will be trying to encourage people to go back and support businesses uh, in, in the community as they come on board. From an economy perspective, focused on the energy industry, the federal government has uh, supported the industry by um, providing $1.7 billion in remedi remediating the abandoned wells through the oil and gas process. And so this will put about 5,300 people back to work immediately and will be deployed in the very near future, which is very helpful. But they also implemented a $750 million reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which uh, focused on their, uh, their climate change goals. And so this is also very helpful because uh, obviously Calgary is a very socially conscious uh, with many people working on these types of projects. And then at the federal level, we're working with the uh, Investing Canada group to, to really work on a foreign direct investment uh, alternative plan. So like many of you, we're doing business retention and expansion. We're also looking at ways that we can go into markets early, including uh, outsourcing people in the markets that we're focused on, but also trying to get all the orders of the government focused on where the greatest need is in Canada. And so... Uh, you know, including greater lead generation into the the provinces that are hurting, which uh, Calgary and Alberta are hurting significantly. We have an economic resilient task force, both at the provincial and the the, the uh, province, city municipal level, which we are active on. In fact, we're active on two of them. And then, of course, we're seeing things like our provincial government make investments into um, pipeline projects. Uh, including cash injections. Uh, in this case, it's a billion dollars plus a loan guarantee for another six billion dollars, so we can get that uh, that pipeline moving as quickly as possible and start to get our products to the international market. So uh, I'll just conclude by saying, um, you know, like many of you, this is an iterative process. It feels like what happens one week changes so much. You almost live a lifetime during the week and uh, you're having to stay on top of these programs and how you help people. Really right now, all we're trying to do is curate information and provide tools for businesses. Tools for businesses. And we'll get very much uh, involved in the promotion and the long-term recovery uh, in the coming weeks. If, if there is one key ingredient that we need for success, it is definitely going to be trust, alignment, and leadership with all orders of government for, in order for us to implement not just our response to COVID, but also our long-term recovery, which, as I say, will be about 20 years. So with that, I'll pass it over I'll to Lauren. Lauren? Lauren, have you unmuted? <laughs> Sorry, I thought I had. Um, thank you, Mary. Um, that, was, uh, that was a very interesting presentation. Um, our second speaker is Juan Pablo Alcantar, uh, Director from Tuxpan Economic Development, Tuxpan, Veracruz, Mexico. Um, Juan Pablo is the 2018-2020 Director for economic development at the city and port of Tuxpan. Um, he 
also works part-time as foreign direct investment consultant for a Japanese multinational firm that is expanding into Latin America. He sits on the board of the Tuscan Medical Center, and previously he was the CEO of a multinational business organization based in Texas for Mexican businesses in the U.S. Um, and U.S. businesses seeking to do business in Mexico. He is currently the vice chair of the International Advisory Committee uh, at the International Economic Development Council. So I'll turn this over to Juan Pablo. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Lauren. Uh, I'll try to now go over my time. So basically, there's a few things that we have to do. Uh, this is for cities who are already thinking on easing the part measures. Well, there's a few things that you have to consider first. Uh, some key things that you consider is that you have to have a better monitoring system than the federal government does. In our case, for the Mexican government, they decided to go with the model of sampling the affected and sampling uh, uh, suspicious cases. So this does not uh, keep the entire x-ray of what is going on at the regional level. So basically when some states in the, in the country of Mexico were already at phase three, some other states were just at phase one uh, uh, of this pandemic and or this epidemic. And this uh, control, basically regions that were already at phase three states and cities started to apply quarantine measures and this created a pro trouble with the federal government because the federal government was saying we're not yet yeah. free maybe at the federal level you were not at phase three but regions and some states were already doing that so the states that were already acting on time they managed to flatten the curve of infected cases and some of them are even starting to think of going back to reopening some sectors of the economy. Basically, there's a few, a few things that you have to consider when doing this. One is that you have to have a pretty uh, accurate monitoring or modeling uh, at your city level. Basically, every hospital, the way they report cases, because most cases do not go to hospitals, so basically, you have a city monitoring center, which we do here, and everyone who thinks they might be case basically reports to that monitoring center, they get a call every morning and every after uh, during the day, and uh, we start to check on their symptoms. Also, every person that goes into a hospital that get admitted into a hospital, that raises a report as well, and we get it at the monitoring center. So basically, oh, no. currently we are still going up on the suspicious cases, even if they are not confirmed because Mexican decided not to do a wide uh, nationwide testing. That means that we still monitor. So basically, if they I'm advising or recommending the major to start easing some of them. They need to have a, an accurate number of the suspicious cases and how they are recovering. We have to, uh, for that so we can monitor each person. The other thing is that your hospital must be able to safely treat all patients requiring hospitalization. That means there has to be ICU beds and ventilators. So that means that you have capacity because as soon as you start to ease measures, you may get a spike on some cases and you need to be able to treat them. Otherwise, you go back to quarantine measures again. And also, the authorities must be able to test everyone if you can. In our case, uh, allow our, our tests, our quick tests were held up at the border. They are not allowed as a uh, means to get accurate numbers of, of infected people. And also, um, just to be, uh, there must be also a sustained reduction in cases for about 14 uh, weeks. In our case, we're going for about three weeks. If we, three weeks, we start to see a decrease or reduction in, in confirmed cases, that means that we're getting to a point where we can start considering reopen, reopening some sectors of the economy. In this case, um, there's one thing that you have to do for economic policy. We went straight to them. We decided since January to start uh, looking at this, start looking at what others were doing. Contacted Asian countries and Asian cities to see what they were doing, especially the ones who showed better uh, results when monitoring. So we went as our health policy or uh, was in economic policy, because if we start to prevent, if we didn't get that many cases, uh, that would be good for us. So we don't have to confirm cases. And the rest of the municipalities around them, they are way higher than the average. So, uh, so far we're doing good on this aspect. The other thing that um, we must be able to consider when it comes to uh, 
the job our office is doing. Basically, our legal uh, or our laws don't allow as much to do loans as a city, but there are legal loops that allow us to funnel capital into businesses. But Mainly, we focus uh, continuity and especially technical knowledge, but we focus a lot on business continuity. Tools, many tools that we started to work with our uh, industries. We have a 52 company, major companies or major industrial companies in our city, so it's easy for us to monitor them. We survey them 15 days, but we also survey the local businesses through chambers and through our uh, online and some databases that we have. We survey everyone 15 days. This allows us to get a pretty accurate x-ray of what is going on in the main street, but also in the industrial zone. And this allows us to funnel specific projects and specific strategies for certain types of businesses. We started to see that uh, basically our maybe clothing and service industry, they were all going, they, they lost from one month to another almost 50% of their sales. Uh, furniture and home furnishing, they also lost, uh, food services and drinking places they went down motor vehicle parts uh, many different uh, miscellaneous so for example retailers also went down but we started to see an increase in other businesses food and beverage that went up to do they started to go up hospitals and uh, or hospitals private hospitals were starting to have issues but small clinics were doing okay and this allowed us to try to uh, focus on the that were getting hit the worst and every 15 days we get a different x-ray some businesses start to consider seeing or firing people and that's where we try to channel our, our funds because they are limited uh, pretty much we work with them stress tests we uh, ask them to out of the entire employee half we ask them to start evaluating which employees have some types of disease and make them vulnerable to the virus and focus the area that they work we start to figure out some companies, their entire accounting department has uh, hypertension, some of them have were diabetic. So basically this industry who has over 180 jobs at this company, he is the entire accounting department was very vulnerable. So that uh, helps us have a, a full x-ray of those businesses. So they can start doing uh, actions to try to mitigate right. of this. Some of them were sent home, they, re they hired some temporary a account and accounting assistant uh, employees who were fired from other companies, they started to hire them temporarily, but that's where they detected vulnerable areas. Uh, we also handle cash flows for a few who uh, wanted to know how much they can uh, they could last without firing people or cutting years or maybe cutting a section of the employee uh, of the plants and focus on some loans. But we here we have limited when it comes to federal and state. But we also managed to, to figure out a way to use city fund and maximize it with the development banks. Uh, we also uh, did strategies for businesses. We did a 10-step article in our magazine online. And we worked with the national, one of the number one universities for executive in Mexico. And this article, even though it was long, it was one of the most seen articles uh, throughout the month. And and this helped us uh, channel that information to businesses as well, so they could start acting acting on time. Uh, we did uh, review some of high chains for many companies, so we can start to predict or try to get a better idea on when this is might actually stop. Vehicles in this at uh, the port of Tuxpan just stopped. Vehicles have stopped as well, and that kept uh, almost 87 drivers, 88 drivers. Uh, truck drivers that were just not moving. So uh, that's how we were acting two weeks ahead. And now we're focusing these drivers to drive for the oil industry, which has also been hit uh, nationwide because of low uh, consumption. But also we're trying uh, new markets for local uh, businesses. We make sure that they have protective equipment and source enough for many companies that needed it. If they want to reopen all their frontline employees and protective equipment, they must have hygiene and health protocols, and especially social distance. We work on redefining the workspace so uh, businesses that had a lot of inside, they, they switch uh, protocols. Some of them have appointments. Some of them just uh, keep people distance outside on the street uh, with certain marks. So basically they have to keep two meters 
uh, distance. And this has been this is able to also work well. They do cleaning and disinfection every night. So every morning it goes back and during the morning and afternoons, they also do some extra cleaning. So we also handle production capacity and especially supermarkets. We worked a lot with supermarkets because protocol, emergency protocols, that's where we decided to work a lot with uh, supermarkets because we always had shortages, supply, resupply, uh, shortages in previous times that we had. Sourcing, we started from local farms and local farmers, uh, things like eggs, meat, some vegetables as well, and have them available for people who were already in quarantine. We asked them not to go out and buy things. City, we decided to take the food to them and also medicines. If they needed medicines, we would take them to pay for those uh, goods and they would be paid to local uh, businesses so we could keep some income going. And the other thing is that we started to look at trends in Europe, Asia, US, to forecast when we think we'll be uh, running out of some goods and where the industry would be affected. That's also something. Well, mostly we're working a lot on business retention and we're trying to keep some of our businesses from leaving, especially the ones who are very connected to uh, climate change worldwide. And we're starting to plan for FDI. Uh, US companies that have some supplies coming from China, they're already thinking on switching their uh, of goods, those goods. We try to put Mexico as one of the, or at least the port of two, one of the uh, locations that they can look at, especially in businesses that are related like we do here. But a city, we did some relief tax for local uh, business people. We did no permitting fees for uh, certain businesses that were already uh, in here. And we focus on loans, which I will talk about at the end of, the, of this. And we focus a lot of industry. We did uh, our service allow us to focus on industry clusters and especially talent clusters. And not just uh, one industry, not just one company, but the entire companies that is related to others, so the entire clusters, and especially talent to see when they might be affected. Well, so far on the industrial zones, they are progressing. Even though the oil industry is being affected, we have, uh, we're focused on storage and distribution. And storage has been very important these past few days. So all our investments in storage are still working. They have uh, good uh, health protocols and hygiene protocols to ensure that their employees do not get infected. Actually, one of those companies, their entire employees are sleeping at business and food is being distributed there. So they don't go out, they don't mix with the, at the markets and they're infected. So that one is working very well uh, too. Uh, our main street space, we do have some of that. Uh, well, like I said, we focus on the proper spacing or social distancing, the redesign of the floor space, appointments, and also protective gear. That one, just to make sure that main streets is the one wants, uh, want to go um, back into business once we decide it's somewhat safe to do it because this will last for a lot of months. Uh, they have all those protocols and we will monitor that they are doing so. Otherwise, we will ask them to shut down to avoid spike on. Um, on infected people or suspicious cases. That one's something that I monitor as well. And tourism, tourism is the one that was hardest hit for, to us. We are a tourism city. We have 42 kilometers of beach. And pretty much here I do advise not to price discounting. This is a very bad strategy. It hasn't worked for many cities that have done it because you know uh, income to start flowing. And if you're doing discounting, you, you make it longer over uh, once you we decide to open the tourism industry. I also don't advise to fall ahead and do marketing efforts because unless we have a vaccine available, our location and distributed enough to everyone, we do not want to push the tourism. Industry. Basically, we are connecting hotels as quarantine locations and we are paying them. People that are coming from outside stay there for 14 days that's to give them some to these uh, hotels. And we are having local restaurants distribute food to these hotels. Now, local pharmacies are distributing uh, medicine to these hotels. So this keeps some come to some hotels. We cannot have them all, but this is so far working well. Uh, but I advise to rush uh, to do marketing efforts unless there is a vaccine available. The industry will be hard to recover 
because once uh, we have a vaccine, people will still use their uh, income and their wages to pay for debt. They will still do it. And maybe some habits or some habits will change and people decide not to travel as much the rest of, the, of this year and maybe even next year. So we expect that full recovery, we won't see it for probably until 22 or maybe 2023 once uh, there is a stabilization worldwide and people have enough income to start traveling again. So we're still going to have to uh, think of extra ways to tourism industry. Mm, but we do offer a lot of technical advisory and timing. Knowing when our federal uh, transfers for local government expenditures come, that was in March. They just got here uh, they just got at the end of March and they're barely start to be uh, signed projects that we have and programs and strategies so that's very very important but at the same time it takes from the moment of the sign to implementation it takes us about three weeks once we get an idea a project or a program uh, design to approval two weeks and then implementation about an extra week uh, complex programs like loans that one those ones will take about a month and a half because they require legislation and uh, the state uh, congress is on recess and it won't go back to uh, full operations until probably maybe the end of May. So, so far, one will have to wait. So, timing is very important that you know. But pretty much loans, if you have insurance, uh, how do you call it, unemployment insurance, we try to focus it directly on businesses, on fire people, and we can keep people employed. And at the same time, we don't have to work on putting all these people back to work because it's a complex. Uh, Programs so far, businesses have been open to it, and our unemployment and insurance is going out there early as a subsidy for businesses, people employed, but at the same time, pay that government health insurance because that one is very important for our population. But uh, just the last one is health protocols, health policies, a marketing campaign on them so because we want people to do it, and we work with our public transit system and our private transit system to make sure that they uh, taxis, for example, that used to carry four to five people inside the taxi, now they can only carry two people. Our buses, they some seats out of the bus, so basically they spaced it out. 50% of the seats were taken out of the bus, and they clean them every almost every six hours, and they do a major decision every night. But this has been at a high cost to the transit system. None of the buses and taxis are not moving. That was a city policy that we implemented. It was not very well received, but it had to be done if we wanted to keep some businesses open. Uh, last but not least, just make sure that you keep your monitoring in place, that you have a good uh, idea of what is going on in your city. Uh, keep some relations, those pretty much those 30, uh, 28 days for February helped us maintain good relationships. So we get good businesses and also they let us know when they think they might be affected because some supplies or their supply is telling them that they're not going to be able to supply them goods. That's a narrowly warning that we get so we can start creating how we're going to react. But out of our local money, we decided to use our $2 million into, we put $6 million total, $2 million per every development in Mexico. We have three. And that allowed us to get uh, 10 million per development bank and we approved to uh, local businesses. So if you have development banks and they have this type of fund, we decided to put 2 million in each and that pre-approved us 10 million at low interest, very low interest, actually a historic low interest for a development bank to start funneling 30 million into our local business because we were limited as a local government on how much money we could put but that helped us uh, maximize the amount of money we could put out there for a local economy. Uh, with that, I leave it to, uh, that's the end of my participation. Great. Thank you very much, Juan Pablo. Um, our next speaker is Dan Silverman. Um, he is a Vice President of Foreign Direct Investment for Invest Quebec um, out of uh, Montreal, Quebec. Um, Mr. Silverman graduated from Concordia's Montreal Concordia University and began his career in 2002 as a junior consultant with the CAI Global Group, a Montreal-based site selection analysis, business location analysis, jurisdictional marketing, and industrial clustering consulting firm. 
In 2005, Mr. Silverman joined ROI Research, uh, uh, ON Investment, a lead prospecting and consulting firm. Mr. Silverman joined Toronto Global in July 2017 as Executive Vice President for Investment Attraction. In January of 2020, Mr. Silverman joined the newly created division of Invest Quebec uh, and Invest Quebec International as its Vice President for Direct Investment. He leads a team of 50 plus foreign direct investment attraction professionals based in Quebec and 12 international offices. And in February 2020, Mr. Silverman was renewed for an additional two years as a director of the International Economic Development Council Board of Directors. I'll turn this over to Dan. Thank you. Great. Thank you so very much, Lauren. And I'll, I'll just wait for the slides to show up here. But um, just as a, as a bit of an introduction, um, I, I tell people I, I started in the end of January, January 27th, 2020, and I've been home, working from home for longer than I was in the office at um, at uh, Invest Quebec. So it's uh, been quite quite the transition. Um, Erica, were you going to pass over the controls to me for the presentation? Well, I'll get started anyways and just give a little bit of a, an overview. Um, in Beth Quebec, um, we are a very uh, unique organization. We're an economic development agency and a financing corporation. We have over 700 employees uh, in 17 offices around the province of Quebec uh, and 12 international offices um, throughout the U.S., Asia, and, and Europe. Uh, our mission specifically is to contribute to, to economic development uh, with our integrated financial solutions, foster local and international growth, and support job creation for the region. Um, in 2018-19, we supported over 1,400 Quebec companies with our financing solutions, so loans, equity investments, venture capital. Um, to jump kind of right into to COVID, because uh, essentially that was my first job when I came on board here. Um, what we did immediately is we created an Invest Quebec International uh, FDI Crisis Committee um, that reports directly into myself, um, and it's made up of our in-market representatives abroad, um, representatives from, from our foreign subsidiaries team, and representatives from our international projects team. Uh, and the reason we did this is so that we could quickly identify and support uh, at-risk companies that are both uh, have existing uh, foreign investment projects to Quebec from abroad, um, identify and support at-risk green uh, foreign subsidiaries that are in the Quebec market already that had projects in place, were about to be announced, were in the beginning phases of looking at projects and see how we could support those as well, um, and really establish a dynamic internal and external communication plan because that was one of the biggest things that we saw with our economic development partners from across Quebec and the federal government. Um, that we need to be very, very specific on the communications plan that we had moving forward. And then also uh, to continue in our role, which is really uh, identifying foreign direct investment opportunities and having a strategic prospecting plan that put that in place. Uh, so this team meets um, weekly, sometimes twice a week. And we, um, we have it led by two people from our foreign subsidiary team and really what they're trying to do are, is identify opportunities and communicate that to the other divisions of Invest Quebec, our partners such as Montreal International, Quebec International, and some of the other cities around the region, as well as our in-market representatives abroad. We did repatriate uh, many of our foreign, uh, uh, many of our people in our foreign offices, but some chose to stay. To jump in, I'm going to jump in, and I know the slides are coming shortly, but I'm going to jump into what the Quebec government really did. And that is, we put together several programs. The first one is called PACT, that's the French acronym, but it's the Concerted Temporary Action Program for Business. Um, it's an emergency funding measure that provides ad hoc and exceptional business support to businesses that are affected by the um, COVID 19. Um, here we go, and I'll jump right in there and move us forward when we have a chance. You let me know when that slides over to me. There we go. So I'll run right through that. Um, eligible businesses for this program, and I'll just go back one slide for you to take a look at that, and it's available on our website. 
Uh, eligible businesses are any businesses that are operating in Quebec, including co-ops and other social economic enterprises, but they have to find themselves in a very precarious situation, um, temporary difficulty as a result. So we've seen some companies that have continued to thrive as normal that have called in, uh, and we've seen other companies that have um, been pushed because of cash flow situations. Um, so they're able to, to look at it. They have to show that they, their financial structure offers a realistic prospect for profitability. So we're not looking at companies necessarily that, that have been in distress um, already. So that is very important for us to take into, real, into account when we're looking at these companies calling into us. Um, like I said before, cash flow issues are, are, are temporary, um, and this is due to the result of, of COVID. Um, a lot of the times, it's a, it's a problem involving the supply of raw materials or products, the inability or, or decreased ability to deliver goods, products, or services. So we've seen a lot of inquiries coming on this program to date. Um, uh, in, in a typical year, we'll probably service about 2,000 calls, and in a few days, we serviced about 1,700. Um, so this really was an opportunity for our government to step up and support Quebec businesses and foreign businesses that are operating in Quebec. The financing details of these types of projects, um, loan guarantee, uh, which is really preferred at all time, and that's a, that's a loan directly with Invest Quebec, uh, close cooperation where we will share the risk with the financial institution, credit guarantee, that's something that was really new to this program that we've done, so new lines of credits or increasing lines of credits, uh, and the minimum amount is, is $50,000. So, um, and we're not looking to refinance companies that have already been financed. So these are the four types of finance details that we've added to this program called PACT again, that's the French acronym. Okay, she froze on me, that's fine. Um, moving forward uh, on here, sorry, I don't know why it doesn't want to move forward for us, but I'll continue anyways. On the other programs that we've come to the table with, um, it's called PACME, and that's uh, PACME COVID-19. And that is a, a concerted action for job retention program. It's a $100 million program put forward by uh, the provincial government. And this is to really provide financial assistance. Um, there we go. Uh, financial assistance uh, to cover training expenses and salaries of employees in training. Uh, up to 100% uh, for expenses under 100,000 and 50% for expenses between 100 and 500,000. Uh, so again, this could be basic training, digital skills, continuing education, um, very important program for when you're retaining employees to kind of what we've seen with a lot of Quebec-based businesses is that they've shifted their production lines on the manufacturing side, which has been quite interesting. Uh, one company that we worked with, um, was a in the textile industry and they repurposed their production lines uh, to make um, uh, in French it's hub but uh, gowns for hospitals a few other programs that have that we have also and um, sorry it's taking a little time to move the slides here uh, the additional support we have the emergency assistance program for small and medium-sized business this is another 150 million dollar program um, like like uh, Mary had mentioned earlier on uh, on the federal, and, and there's also provincial, but it's the deferral of income tax payments until September 2020. I don't know if that'll change or not. Uh, the deferral of, uh, of sales tax, which is uh, until June 30th, 2020, and loans and loan guarantees in, prod in progress. Um, so a moratorium or the repayment of loans, and I know that we've implemented that for several of our clients already and foreign clients. And then there's the Buy Quebec. So we have really tried to encourage um, uh, Penny Bleu, which is basically a blue basket, um, is to for people based here in Quebec to buy locally, to support local business. And that includes foreign subsidiaries that are, that are here. So to date, approximately 7,400 businesses have signed up. The government has been very proactive in promoting this, this product um, and, and really moving things forward. Uh, the other part that I'll go into, this is kind of the end of my presentation, but I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing um, with our partners here uh, as Montreal International, Quebec International, which are at the regional level. Uh, Montreal International hosted a um, foreign subsidiary webinar with our um, provincial economic development minister. Um, and what we did is Montreal, Quebec, and the province of Quebec brought in about 100 foreign subsidiaries to have basically about an hour with the minister and ask specific questions and, and learn about the future plan and 
what the what the gradual rollout of of getting back to maybe what the new normal would be and, and it really gave an opportunity for um, our companies that are here um, from abroad to, to speak with a high level um, political official that and they can he could address their concerns and that lasted about an hour with quite a bit of follow-up in that uh, together also we've been working with our local partners on identifying at-risk foreign multinationals that we could talk to but also supporting uh, Quebec-based businesses as well with our team of experts. Um, again, as I said earlier, um, we're all we're an economic development agency and a financing corporation. You don't find very many of those, but um, we do have um, the new division that Laura mentioned, Invest Quebec International, is basically made up of our uh, export slash trade group and and my group, which is foreign direct investment. So we're all essentially right now working as one organization to support Quebec-based businesses that are looking to export products and services, but also looking at supporting Quebec businesses just to keep their doors open while continuing proactively to do foreign direct investment with companies that have active projects in mind that aren't as affected by COVID or seeing how we can support some of those projects that are continuing to move forward or slowing down slowly. So we've adjusted a little bit, um, well, a little bit, a little bit more than a little bit, um, our foreign direct investment plans. We still have a very aggressive target for the year. We are working with our, our political officials as well as uh, Invest Quebec and our partners on some very specific targeting during COVID. And I've already started to put together our action plan post COVID, both for exports and for FDI. So that's a little bit um, of what we're doing here in the province of Quebec. I think one of the greatest um, things to come out of this is to really show the importance of uh, transparency, uh, collaboration and coordination amongst uh, the three levels of government, federal, provincial and um, and regional or, or, or local government and how we're working together to support our own businesses, but also keep um, foreign businesses that have landed in Quebec here as well as encourage more to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Um, our next speaker is Greg Clark. Uh, he is a global advisor with Future Cities and New Industries based out of London, UK. Um, Greg is a global advisor and author on cities and urban economics, leadership and investment. He provides thought leadership on the evolution of the metropolitan Century supports leaders in more than 100 cities worldwide on strategy positioning and advises global firms on the investment and enterprise opportunities of an urbanizing world. He is the author of 10 books and more than 100 reports um, and a city expert on BBC World Series, My Perfect City. Um, I'll turn this over to Greg. Thank you. Well, good evening from London. And uh, it's uh, dark here and it's already cold, but it's a pleasure to have a chance to speak to an IEDC audience this evening. I'm going to be uh, sharing some insights from two pieces of work that I've been doing over the last few months. One of them is a networking activity with 20 global cities looking at the challenges they face as a result of COVID-19 and trying to think ahead about the implications this is going to have on their economies going forward. And the second piece is a piece of work I've been doing with uh, HSBC, the Global Bank, where I work some of my time, looking at the impact of COVID-19 on the global economy, and particularly on sectors and on the fiscal capacity of governments to respond to it. I'd like to stress I'm speaking in a personal capacity this evening, and I'm not representing any organization in what I have to say. Um, the group of global cities I've been working with contain uh, particularly business-led civic organizations. These are uh, business organizations that have an interest in the future of the whole metropolitan economy. And we've brought together a group from London, New York, Paris, Tokyo, Chicago, San Francisco, Tel Aviv, Sydney, Brisbane, Amsterdam, Sao Paulo, Toronto, Vienna, Hong Kong, Singapore, Johannesburg, Cape Town, Bogota, and Mumbai. And it's been very interesting working with this group to try to understand how COVID-19 is playing out in these metropolitan areas and uh, what it means for the future of urban economic development in these locations. 
Now, most of these large metros are still in lockdown. They're still in a situation where the main impact of COVID-19 is the closing down of their economy in order to protect and in the end uh, help the populations of those cities uh, to survive the pandemic. But many of them uh, are also, of course, trying to make the most of various government support programs, whether those are support programs for smaller or larger companies, whether they're targeted at specific industries, or whether they're focused on trying to keep people in work and preventing uh, large scale unemployment that would become a long term cyclical challenge. Many of them are also, though, beginning to think ahead. They're asking the question. What do we learn from this crisis and from this shock? Uh, how could our economy be more resilient in the future? What are our economy's revealed weaknesses as a result of this? How can we understand the impact of the shock? Which things that are happening in our economy now will be cyclical? Which ones will be structural? Which ones will be transformational? Which ones are largely behavioral? And what will be the sorting effect of this crisis on our economy? You see, we come from the view that a crisis of this kind has a sorting effect. It differentiates between losers and winners. And it does this both at the level of individual firms. It does it, of course, with individual workers and their families. But it also does it at the level of sectors and places and perhaps whole cities or regions or metropolitan areas, and in the end, perhaps whole companies as well. And we're keenly observing how this winners and losers dynamic is beginning to take shape, particularly thinking about the reputational advantages and disadvantages of different ways that city, regional, state, provincial, federal and national governments are responding. The group that we've been working with have identified four phases to COVID-19. Firstly, of course, there's the lockdown, the phase which almost everyone is in at the moment. Secondly, they look forward to a transition where lockdown is gradually unlocked and there's a movement back towards various elements of normality. In two of the cities in our group, Hong Kong and Singapore, there's been a return to lockdown after an initial phase of transition when uh, infections began uh, to catch on again. But the idea is that ultimately transition out of lockdown will have certain characteristics to it. We then look forward to a phase of recovery. And that phase of recovery following the transition ought to be the time when we see, as it were, jobs, investment, enterprise and trade coming back into our economies. And then eventually we look forward to some kind of new normal. But the challenge with thinking about COVID in these four phases of lockdown, transition, recovery, and a new normal is that the shape, the pace, and the gradient of how those phases are undertaken will be different in every country, different in every region, and different in every city. And we believe that's because of some underlying factors that I want to talk a little bit about now before coming back to the seven key themes for thinking about the post-COVID urban or regional economy uh, into the medium term. The first theme I want to raise very quickly is to do with public budgets and to do with indebtedness. We've created comparative data that show us that Italy, the UK, Germany, Malaysia, Australia, France, and other countries have been the most generous in the guarantees they've provided in the fiscal stimulus that they have put forward. And other countries, perhaps India, Mexico, South Korea, Taiwan, Philippines at the other end of the scale, have invested a smaller percentage of their GDP in their uh, recovery and support program. What that leads to is an astonishing league table of public indebtedness emerging from efforts to support our economies through this crisis, both at the federal and the national level, but also, of course, at state, provisional, regional, and local levels. And the issue about public indebtedness and how it impacts on the ability of governments to invest into the future is a critical one that's taken a lot of our attention in the analysis so far. 
A second focus of the analysis has been on the collapse in consumption that's happened as a result of the lockdown measures and the way in which this has had differential effects across different sectors of the economy and employment. On the one hand, we can identify very quickly an obvious group of sectors that have been hugely negatively impacted by the COVID lockdowns. Hospitality, aviation, travel, tourism, catering, recreation and leisure, entertainment, and, uh, and other kinds of activities that essentially require people to be together in the same place, having the same experience, spending their money. We can move on to another group that have a kind of medium high impact from the lockdown. Mining and natural resources, construction, transportation, other services, retail, student housing, universities, and similar things. We then identify a third group, those that have a medium to low impact, manufacturing, uh, non-essential retail, food retail, uh, corporate and industrial real estate. And then finally, a group of sectors where we identify either no impact or a net positive impact. Technology, utilities, telecommunications, agriculture, food production, and of course, healthcare. How cities and regions are responding to the COVID-19 crisis depends upon the industrial structure that they have. What concentration of the most vulnerable sectors versus what advantages they glean from having some specialization in the sectors that are benefiting and how far they can transition their economies towards that. A third variable we've been looking at is the, the medical interventions that are possible with the COVID-19 virus. And of course, we recognize that there's a I'm just checking that I can be heard. I can hear you again. Sorry, I, it seemed to me that my uh, my my micro. Um, what was the last thing I, I said, Mary or Lauren? Greg, we only lost about a paragraph. Okay, great. So the, um, the, the third issue we've been looking at is the medical interventions and how they will enable different kinds of sectors. It's fairly obvious, for example, that if we were able to get uh, reactive care, some kind of medical treatment of a pharmaceutical nature, we may well see that particular sectors in the area of uh, uh, real estate, in telecoms, in utilities, energy and others would open up. In other words, they would enable people to act together, to, uh, to buy and to, in, to enjoy consumption without necessarily being in confined spaces. There's a second set that we think might benefit from advanced testing and other kinds of securitization of space. Cinemas, entertainment, pubs, restaurants, other places where you could secure uh, place sharing activities. And then finally, of course, if we're able to generate a vaccine that is trusted and credible, we think this will have a positive effect on real estate, travel, luxury goods, hotels, and many other activities that require high levels of human interaction. So the analysis that we've done starts to show that different cities, different regions, different national economies are affected in different ways, depending upon, firstly, the health of public sector budgets, secondly, the industrial uh, character that they have, and thirdly, the kinds of medical interventions that are going to be widely available in those locations. And looking at all of the cities and how they're responding to this crisis involves understanding where they are with each of those variables and how they're planning uh, for the medium term future. Now, in the discussions that we've had with the 20 or so cities, there are seven common themes that have emerged as being the medium term agenda items that will come from COVID-19. I'm going to share them with you very briefly, and I think they'll be familiar to many people here on the call. The first one, of course, is the big uptick in digital transformation. 
the move towards as a service models or serviceization, if you prefer that. The big kick that has resulted not just in the way digital telecommunications are being used for many business transactions, for education, for entertainment and for communication with one another, but the widespread use of digital systems now, both in the provision of public services, including telemedicine, and digitization, if you like, as a mechanism also to conclude all sorts of advanced financial transactions. In other words, we've had public policies and incentives for a long time to help us to jump through cycles towards a more mature digital system. But this crisis, more than any other thing that's happened in the last 30 years, is a catalyst for digital transformation and for a massive uptick in the digitization of industries. The second issue that's emerged very strongly is the supply chain uh, challenges and the flows of trade. As it were, we begin to see uh, governments particularly, but also media and businesses, beginning to focus much more on the need to onshore, reshore, securitize and guarantee the provision of certain uh, uh, products, services and equipment that are deemed to be absolutely essential now for national or regional security. The obvious example of this is the conversation happening around the world about the manufacture and distribution of PPE, uh, protective uh, clothing, particularly for healthcare workers. But there are many, many other examples concerning food, concerning energy, and of course, concerning vital components for various kinds of machinery. So we expect to see a relocalization or an onshoring agenda emerging very strongly from this. The third one is the newfound uh, uh, interest in health and well-being, and particularly the observation that people who have been most vulnerable to this virus have been people who began with some underlying health condition, and the realization of the, the human cost of this and the many challenges that come with that. We see increasing awareness amongst the insurance industry, for example, for having much more incentivized approach to healthy living and to healthy lifestyles. And we think this could be a long-term and important change. The fourth issue is, of course, the interest in climate change and sustainability. Although we know, of course, that different countries around the world espouse different policies in this regard, uh, and, uh, and, and many of them uh, people will be aware of, the link between human health and planetary health particularly through the food systems and where that involves the animal kingdom, has become a central issue now in public discourse in a way that it wasn't before. And we think that this is going to have major effects on food production. It will have effects on understanding uh, the way that we treat animal habitats. And we believe that this unintended or this accidental demonstration project that we've been living through in low carbon living will have the effect of proving, as it were, a proof of concept that it's possible to live somewhat more lower carbon lives. And therefore, we think that could accelerate changes. The fifth point is about what we call the spatial implications. Uh, one obvious example of this is that shared spaces shared services, shared systems, real estate, public transit, uh, public spaces, entertainment venues, convention centers, sports stadia, all of these uh, are, have become unsafe as a result of this virus. And of course, there's no guarantees that there won't be further viruses to come. So many people are interested not just in how the uptick in digitization has an effect on those industries that used to be only performed live in certain kinds of locations, but also on how we might reorganize space within our cities and between our cities and between our cities and our rural areas, possibly seeing a much more distributed kind of concentration of activities uh, across a wider range of places into the future. The sixth theme that emerges from this as a medium term issue is, of course, geopolitics and the geopolitical impacts. This, of course, has a lot to do with the relationship between China and the rest of the world, 
to do with the, uh, the, the, the trade discourse, if I can use that word, between China and the US, but also to do with the fact that many of the Asian countries and cities have been uh, earlier affected and also have proved to be, in certain ways, much more effective in dealing with this kind of challenge and therefore garnering a kind of reputational advantage that also chimes with uh, where population growth and economic growth is happening in the world. So an acceleration of the trend eastwards, if we can put it that way. And then the seventh theme that has emerged from the conversations we've had is about a new social contract. The realization that on the one hand, as people live in lockdown, there has been the renewal of social capital, uh, community feeling, neighborliness in many of the cities and the regions where we live. And on the other hand, the recognition that all sorts of people, particularly healthcare workers perhaps, have been recognized for their heroic acts during this period of crisis. And we believe that there may be the opportunity to build upon this with new kinds of community development, new kinds of uh, uh, neighborhood to neighborhood uh, partnerships, and if you like, the renewal of a social contract agenda. Now, it's much too soon to say what the medium term impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic are going to be on our urban and regional economies. But it's not too soon to start thinking about that question and to start to ask yourselves the question, which of the changes that we're experiencing now are going to be temporary? Which ones are going to be permanent? Is our city or our regional economy exposed to vulnerable industries? Are we able to be resilient in the future if this happens again? And how will human behavior, and particularly the way people want to consume in the future, change what we expect of our municipalities, the services that they provide, and the economies that they host? Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we have a number of questions that uh, people have been logging throughout. Um, and I think um, one of the first questions I'd like to start with um, kind of goes back to the, the, the basic understanding of what's happening at, at various cities. Um, one of the questions that's been posed is how long were the respective um, cities under stay at home or shelter in place orders? And what's been the, the general duration? Um, and were all businesses, especially retail stores, closed during that time? What funding was made available to them from the national government, state government? Um, and what about public places, parks, beaches, hiking trails, et cetera? Were these also closed? So um, maybe what I'll do is, is, is I'll start with the order of the speakers. Um, and if everybody has a, a perspective to share there uh, in a minute or two, that would be great. Um, so Mary, I, I'm not sure if you've got any, any feedback you'd like to uh, to add there with respect to that. Sure, uh, Lauren, just so, I think there were a couple of questions there. Maybe you can just unpack them for me. Once again, I heard about retail, correct? Um, and then I heard- so How long, huh? how long, sorry, um, the question was, how long were the respective cities under stay at home um, shelter in place orders? And were all businesses stores closed during that stay at home period? And then with respect to the funding issue, um, what, what funding was made available? Yeah, sure. Um, so just, uh, so the state of emergency, I believe was called on March the 19th. Most people were working from home by March the 12th. So we're in our seventh week. Uh, and we uh, actually don't have a return to work policy yet as we're still, our numbers are still pretty high as far as diagnosis goes. Um, and, and, and frankly, deaths at this point, right? So it, it's all relative, but we're still in 200, 200 a day, 200 plus a day range for diagnosis. So um, our neighboring provinces both have uh, back to work, um, back to work um, programs that they have uh, announced and uh, to the East our province, which we, we actually, there's, there's some cities or towns that are shared uh, across the pro across the border, which makes it a little bit more complex, but they actually have a state, uh, uh, five phased in um, approach. So they're um, right now only essential services are allowed. Then they're going to start to let other medical and health. Then it goes to 
you know, uh, hairdressers or um, more kind of personal care type of things and eventually rolling into uh, hopefully all, all people back to work. But um, they, uh, it is, it's quite, it's about over about six weeks. And so our province itself hasn't announced that, but it makes it difficult when our neighboring provinces have, have done that. So we are essentially just essential services, grocery stores, gas stations, um, obviously some medical services, uh, all, a, all, all surgeries have been postponed if they're non-urgent surgeries. Um, our parks are closed, both our national parks as well as uh, our provincial parks um, and the majority of retail. All restaurants are closed except for to um, curbside pickup. So it's quite extensive and we feel like, you know, we could be about halfway through. We, we think we're still probably six or seven weeks away from having any kind of rollout of return to work. Thanks. Oh, funding. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I would say, yeah. The one that, that's probably most comp comprehensive is the uh, Canadian um, that I mentioned in the presentation, which is the, um, uh, the Canadian uh, emergency business account, which allows businesses to, uh, to uh, borrow up to $40,000, $10,000 of which will be, uh, it's all interest free, $10,000 will be um, uh, just forgiven and thirty dollars will be, have to be paid back by the end of 2022. So I, I would, um, Juan Pablo or uh, Dan, did you want to respond in any way to this question? I can make it quick. I'll make it quick. Uh, so basically, sure. the variables that we are considering for uh, lifting the quarantine or stay at home are based on where the national uh, status of the infected cases are going. Now they are still going up. We are phase three. So basically, we're still getting more infected people. The other that the municipalities around us and our network of bus transit um, cities, and uh, that's a variable that we actually check upon. Uh, one of our neighboring cities still has about 30 confirmed cases, about five deaths already, and many suspicious uh, cases that they have. So basically, unless the surrounding municipalities are not yet a phase of uh, maybe zero or at least three weeks showing a drastic reduction in suspicious cases and confirmed cases. We don't consider to leave the team or stay at home. Uh, people older than 50 years old, we are asking them to stay, uh, still remain uh, at home. And also people with some of the uh, illnesses that make them vulnerable. We're asking companies to allow them to work from home. We ask them to have special programs in which they can either pay a bit of a little bit extra to get internet for the ones that don't have internet, and maybe even allow them to use an office computer until they can still work from home. But basically, uh, we have not put a force restriction on movement inside the city. Uh, businesses can still work at some level, but estimating that around 70% of businesses have closed. Our industrial zone is still is open because we are a port and many goods still come inside and ex are export imported through here. So that area still has to maintain uh, rolling. So we will put shifting quarantine and stay at home orders until the federal government moves to phase four with that when we are able to control the curve in the graph or when we see three weeks uh, reduction of cases. But that will be, uh, that's not business as usual. That's not like for everyone to open. This will just be uh, based on stages and we'll go through phases of which businesses can uh, reopen. Some of them will still remain, for example, some of them will still remain as quarantine areas, but this will just be for some essential uh, services. As we get a vaccine or a medicine or some type of treatment that can uh, cure the disease or maintain people immune to it because right now herd immunity and governments have decided to go with that strategy the world health organization has uh, published that there's no evidence yet to suggest that people are immune once they recover the virus so they can still get infected again so that strategy at a national level doesn't play out worldwide so we're trying to make sure that 
uh, we keep social distancing. We will be able to reopen sectors to the economy, but not all. And that's when we pretty much uh, our three or four variables evaluating tells us that it's safe to do so, and only if businesses maintain uh, the strict uh, regulations imposed so they can remain open. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to shift gears a little bit, uh, just keeping an eye on, on the clock. Um, we've heard a, a lot of our speakers touch on the impact that this is likely to have on foreign direct, foreign direct investment activity. Um, and I just wonder um, how you propose um, to advance your FDI interest activities, uh, planning and programming um moving forward over the next say 12 to to 18 months and maybe uh, if i can start with with dan um and hear dan's perspective on that that'd be great thanks um i think uh we're a little bit different as we're fortunate enough to have offices in in well 12 different international offices throughout the the us europe and um and asia so we do have people uh, in market who can obviously entertain phone calls and, and, and do outreach and prospecting in those markets. But we've really started looking at um, very strategically what sectors um, are, are really going to benefit the Quebec economy, which sectors is the Quebec government really looking at um, from a targeting perspective. We have a very strong focus on um, electric vehicle manufacturing and battery manufacturing or just the electrification of vehicles so we've been having a key focus on that um, again I mentioned before we're, we're, we're over 50 FDI professionals on, on my team um, here and abroad um, so FDI is a huge component of, of what we do so um, we've started to look at in December my my team uh, December and January my team kind of put their strategic plans together for each one of the markets and we've asked them to go back and revise that due to COVID uh, one of the people in our Paris office also covers the Italian market and, and obviously that's not a market that we're going to be really proactively going after uh, right now but what is it that we can do to support foreign businesses. The other thing that we're doing is 70% of investment a lot of the time is reinvestment. So how can we really take care of what's already in our backyard? Um, let's not really focus 100% on going elsewhere. When it's a lot easier, uh, you know, it's a lot easier to keep an FDI or, or a foreign subsidiary here than it is to go and attract a new one. So how can we work with our partners um, across Quebec and the federal government to support the existing foreign businesses that we have here. So we've, we've, we've kind of, we're in the process of putting a strategy together. Um, we're in the process of, of really maximizing the opportunity of having people that are out there in market and still focusing on some of the very core sectors um, that benefit the Quebec economy. I think it's great. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to, um, again, um, we're coming to the end of the uh, the time for the webinar, uh, but I'd like to put the last question to Greg, if I might. Um, knowing the work that you've done with, with jurisdictions, cities um, across the world, um, the last big question, how do we prepare better? You talked a little bit about supply chain capacity, digital transformation, um, but how how do cities and regions prepare better for something like this, knowing this is probably not the last time we'll have to deal with a pandemic. Lauren, this is Jeff. You're not gonna like this answer. Greg's internet went down. He's not with us this minute. Oh, that's so unfortunate. That is so unfortunate. Um, well, I guess then the, um, the, one, the one observation, and, and I'm not sure who would wade into to this from a, from a response perspective, um, one of the issues that, that has obviously been laid bare through this pandemic is the impact that it's having on our at-risk communities, um, whether that's the elderly, um, whether it, it's um, more ethically diverse neighborhoods, um, whether it's our low-income communities. Um, we, we see it regardless of what city we look at. Um, I, I wonder with the, the speakers that are left, um, whether there's a perspective on the role that economic development might have um, in trying to support some of these areas from an economic development perspective uh, moving forward. Uh, 
um, I'll, I'll I'll jump in on that one, and uh, then Mary, if you if you want to get in order to, I think from from our perspective, like I said, we've had to take a little bit of a different approach, especially in these first um, you know six weeks of of isolation, is how we work with our our municipal and, and regional partners to help support the businesses and the um, at risk organizations, as well as communities that we have in Quebec. And I think that the Quebec government's taken a very proactive approach to it, but we've um, we've very much reshifted. I think probably about 12 to 15 people on my FDI team immediately jumped on our call center to assist with inbound calls. And those, that was the, you know, almost 1,700 calls we got over a couple of days um, to support from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So the whole team at Invest Quebec, from from you know the, the president down, has has kind of come up to the plate to figure out ways of how we can continue to support existing businesses, support the people of Quebec. Um, Invest Quebec, my my team, Claude from my team has also been heavily involved in sourcing uh, PPE from around Quebec, from abroad, uh, to bring not only just to Quebec but to bring to Canada and, and help uh, our our frontline workers. Um, you know, in an effort to, to combat COVID. Thanks, Dan. Mary, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think there's a couple of pieces to it. Um, you know, I think not too similar to Dan, we've been doing lots of local outreach, um, but we also have this uh, business sector support task force, which includes a lot of nonprofits, small businesses, um, and um, you, and so, you know, there are, we've been implementing many tactics to try to deal with the, the uh, more vulnerable populations. Uh, obviously, our convention center is set up for homeless people, um, which is increasing. And then, I, and then, you know, I would just say, you know, we've been dealing, in, and I think as economic developers, we always have to think about shared prosperity in good times and in bad times, but particularly now it requires most you know, a lot of attention and and I'm happy to see our provincial and our municipal government working much more closely together to try to solve that problem in the urban centers in particular. Um, and then I think longer term, you know, we're, we're just, you know, I think um, Greg pointed out a really good point that uh, which ties really close to something that we're working on. So obviously we've had high unemployment for a long time. Uh, a lot of people have been out of work for three, four years, but they're not leaving Calgary. And most of that has to do with cost of living, great quality of life, but they're still unemployed people. And so we've been working with uh, that population to try to get them to uh, transition from kind of conventional or traditional engineering into more digital. So we're running a program which is called Energy to Digital Growth Education and Upskilling, which is a pilot project we're doing. And I think most jurisdictions are gonna to have to do this post COVID and also at, in the new economy anyway. And so we're trying to get more people placed and we've been able to run those programs during COVID. So people are upskilling to become, you know, software engineers or data scientists or coders, programmers or project managers in technology. And it's a great pilot, but we need to put thousands of people through that post-COVID, uh, which will just be amplified by this digital system adoption that Greg talked a lot about. So, um, you know, I think there's homelessness, there's nonprofits, there's mental health issues, and then there's this long-term talent transition thing that we're, we have a focus on, on all of those things right now. All right. Thank you. Jeff, with two minutes to spare, I'll hand it back to IEDC staff if there's um, any other questions or comments from uh, from your end. Uh, Lauren, uh, I want to thank you and the panel for a provocative discussion about what's going on um, in, in both the balance of North America and then in Greg's presentation uh, from other places in the world. I think this is helpful and I've been monitoring the comments and a number of people have been very interested in this. And many people are sending uh, uh, nice comments to uh, many of the speakers. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will continue our webinar series on Monday. We will be having a webinar for the public-private partnerships, how do you raise money in times like this? And uh, uh, there will be a number of other webinars coming up. A week from today begins Economic Development Week. So if you run an economic development organization, I hope you're thinking about 
uh, how you can celebrate in the time of crisis. Thank you very much, Lauren, and the balance of this panel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.